Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center. Coming Economic Control with James Rafferty. Good morning, friends, and welcome to the 3ABN Worship Center right here located in Thompsonville slash West Frankfort, Illinois. Thank you for taking the time to join us this beautiful Sabbath morning. It's cold outside, but the Lord is warming our hearts on the inside. Can the church say amen to that? God has blessed us from night to night with Pastor James Rafferty focusing on the timely, all-important messages of Revelation chapter 13. So don't change the channel. Maybe you want to hit the record button, invite your family and friends to sit down and understand the time in which we live. These are challenging times for anyone who names the name of Christ. It's not just to inform you about the prophecies of Revelation chapter 13, but what we should do in light of these prophecies, and most importantly, the relationship that we should have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, normally I would open with prayer, but this morning I've given that opportunity to Pastor James Rafferty, but I, as I sing this song, this morning, I have made up my mind. I stand with the Hebrews in the fiery furnace. I stand with Daniel in the lion's den and with all the faithful. When fame and fortune and all the things that the world has to offer us comes to our table, the songwriter said it best, I'll worship only at the feet of Jesus. I went to visit the shrines of plenty, but found its storerooms all filled with dust. Then I bowed at altars of gold and silver but as I knelt there they turned to rust so I'll worship only at the feet of Jesus Pilgrim to journey to fame's promised heights, but as I climb, all oh, the promises faded. Yes, his cup alone is my holy grail. There'll be no other gods before. Desert dust and empty shadows, all oh, promise. 
promises now turned to lies for the gods of earth failed and betrayed me for you Amen, John. Thank you. Again, you are blessed to have preachers that can sing and singers that can preach. I can't do both of those things, but God is good. By His grace, we can at least get the preaching part done as long as we stay in the Word. How are you this morning? Just want to wish you a blessed day, which is what it is, isn't it? We are in the prophecies of the Bible, Daniel and Revelation. That's where we've been all week, and we're just going to continue there. We're going to open our Bibles to Revelation 13, and as we do that, we're just going to pause for a moment or two and ask the Holy Spirit to be here to lead and guide our hearts and our minds. Father in heaven, just thank you this morning again for the opportunity to open your word, to ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. You have directed us to him as the anointing that teaches us so that we don't need to rely on any man to teach us and guide us, but we can go directly to your word. And that's what we want to do today and every day. Father, this opportunity we give to you. That's why we're here. It's a time of fellowship, of worship, and of study, prayer. And we just want to praise you for this opportunity, for this day in time that you have covenanted to be with us, that you've set aside to bless us and fellowship with us. Answer our needs, meet our hearts, desires, direct us, guide us, protect us, keep us, prepare us through your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we are in Revelation. I want to share with you a little story or an illustration. This goes back to 1847, over 165 years ago. There were a group of people, not more than 100 people, that had survived a bitter disappointment. There had been thousands of people involved in a movement that led to a proclamation of the return of Jesus Christ in October of 1844. And just a few years after this disappointment, there were just, well, 50 to 100 people that had held on to the truths that had motivated and spurred this movement. And that group of people was scattered a scattered little flock. And there was a book that was put together by a couple of pioneers. Well, three to be exact. There was a man by the name of James White, another man by the name of Joseph Bates, and then there was a young lady by the name of Ellen White. She was about 18. James White was about 25. And Joseph Bates, well, he was a real old guy, like about my age. (laughs) I'm 51. And they put this book together, and they wrote it to the little flock that was scattered abroad. Anyone know what the name of that book was? A Word to the Little Flock. A Word to the Little Flock. I would encourage you to find that book and read it, and you can find it in a couple of different places. I was 
listening to it this morning because I was able to, to do that, and it's reminded me of a lot of our past. And in this book, there was a lot of clarification about certain interpretations of prophecy. Primarily, James White was dealing with Revelation 13 and Daniel 11. And his point was this. It is clear when you read Revelation chapter 13 and Daniel 11, specifically the last verses and especially verse 45, that probation has not closed yet. Michael has not stood up yet. The seven last plagues have not been poured out yet. The time of trouble has not begun yet. The resurrection has not taken place yet. He was encouraging the little flock. Yes, we were disappointed, and yes, we misunderstood some of the detail of, you know, what 1844 was all about, but there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because I think it will help us this morning as we make a connection in this presentation about coming economic control between Revelation 13 and Daniel 11. There are a number of connections. I've been doing a study, an outline that is developing about a dozen or so connections between those two sections of Scripture, specifically Daniel 11, 40 to 12, 3, and Revelation 13, 1 through 18. But this morning we want to look at one specific connection, and that is the connection that predicts economic control. We're going to look at this from two perspectives, and I'm going to take you back to a statement from James White in a word little flock as we close but right now we're going to skip ahead to Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. Just look at these verses with me. It's, in a sense, a bold prediction. And we are a people of bold predictions, but those bold predictions are based, I hope, on the sure word of prophecy. We have nothing to fear in making bold predictions if they are founded on the sure word of prophecy. And so here's what the Word of God says in Revelation 13, 15, and 16, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now we've identified in previous presentations that a beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom or a power, an earthly kingdom or a power. So this is talking about an earthly kingdom or a power Specifically, we've also identified that this power in Revelation chapter 13 includes the United States of America. An earthly kingdom or a power that has the might, the strength, the influence, the economic backbone to actually cause the entire world to, well, to face economic boycott. You might say, well, that's a pretty bold statement we make it based on a lot of information that we've already looked at, but I would like to suggest a few things that would help us to understand how this is even possible. Because the statement, first of all, is made on the Word of God. I remember, again, when I first accepted the Adventist message in 1984, and the, the biggest power in the world back then was not the United States, it was the USSR. And the idea that the United States was going to be prominent, preeminent in enforcing upon the world economic boycott that all the other nations would follow their lead, well, that just seemed like a stretch to me, difficult to accept. But I did by faith. Only by faith. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, or the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. Anyway, Hebrews 11 verse 1, the idea was, was that most of the evidence that I had seen already in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation had bolstered, had developed, had strengthened my faith to believe that, well, even though I didn't see this happening in the world, it was going to happen because God was clearly indicating from all the evidence that it would happen. And that's where faith steps in. And draws a line between what we can see and feel and what God says. 
There's a lot of things that I see and feel in my life that make it feel like it's impossible for God's word to be fulfilled in me, for me. I feel unworthy. I feel like a sinner. I see myself failing Jesus. I see myself falling short of the glory of God. I feel like I'm never going to make it. But what does God's word say? I'm the author and I'm the finisher. I'm going to finish what I began. I am going to overcome by the grace of Jesus Christ. His grace is sufficient for me. These are the promises of God. And so I have to rest my case on those promises no matter how ugly I look when I look in the mirror in the morning or in the evening or any time during the day. I'm not talking about physical appearance, though that might apply also <laughs> as I get older. I'm talking about the ugliness, the horror of the selfishness that I see over and over again in my life. And it's the same with Bible prophecy. And Bible prophecy cannot be separated from personal Christian experience. They are connected like a hand in glove, even more so, like veins in our hands, carrying the lifeblood of faith to our heart, to our brain, to everywhere. And so as I look at the world today, I say, okay, difficult, 84, really difficult today, maybe more so. We think about, for example, economic boycotts that have taken place against nations like Iran and North Korea and Cuba. We think about the economic influence that has taken place in countries that are Muslim, like Pakistan, where the day that businesses are closed in this Islamic state is Sunday and not Friday for economic reasons. As we look at this evidence, and the point here in using these examples is not to make judgments for or against those actions and the nations that follow our lead in those actions. It's just to point them out as a matter of fact. They are examples that help us to see that this prophecy in Revelation can be fulfilled. That we have already principles in place that are leading us in this direction for good or bad reasons, whatever you want to say. And that down the stream of time, the general trajectory, the general uh, consummation of events today are leading us to a place where these words will be completely fulfilled. Because people, whether they're secular or not, panic when Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, when the wars and rumors of wars terrify them, when commotions and fearful signs in the heavens and earthquakes and natural disasters overwhelm them. Think about 9-11. Just before 9-11 took place in this country, one of the biggest issues that was to be being debated in the public sphere was prayer in public, prayer at football games, <laughs> in high schools, uh, nativity scenes. I mean, there was just this, this debate, this conflict that was taking place. 9-11 hit, and the President of the United States got on the TV, and he prayed on national television. He prayed. <laughs> The debate was over. The conflict was done. It was settled. There was a crisis before us. And that crisis filled the churches, filled the pews, and united all of us under a religious umbrella of sorts. Now, multiply that crisis according to Matthew 24, 8, and of course Mark 13 and Luke 21 where Jesus says these signs of natural disasters and wars and, and terror and, and commotions in the heavens, these signs are going to increase. They're going to be like birth pains. They're going to increase with intensity and frequency until finally all the nations are going to unite together. They're going to have to unite together. They're going to have to do it to somehow remedy, to somehow solve, to somehow bring hope to the world who have forsaken the only hope and that is the hope we have in Jesus. So this first scripture in Revelation chapter 13 indicates that there's going to be some economic control. And it doesn't matter in this time if you are rich or poor. It doesn't matter in this time if you are strong or weak, if you are bond or free. It doesn't matter. The control is going to be of such a nature that it's, going to, that it's going to take a hold of everyone. Everyone's going to have to conform to this economic control. I would say everyone will conform because it's going to be more of a situation where it's like, you know, we really need to do this. I mean, who's going to oppose those things that have been implemented as a result of 9-11? Certainly I'm not. I'm not going to go to the airport and say, oh, I'm sorry, but I want to put my liquids in my bag and I want to take them through. 
and I want to have my little pocket knife in there, and there's no way you're going to take that away from me. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that. This is for the good of the whole nation. This is for the good of the world. Think about the pressure that's going to come down on you, on us, in that time when worship, which is repeated here seven or eight times in Revelation 13 and 14, becomes the central focus of the issue about which this economic boycott centers. Think about where our faith is going to be then when we are tested to stand for Jesus by saying a prayer for our food in public. <laughs> you ever been in that kind of a situation? I travel a lot and sometimes I'm in an airport, sometimes I'm traveling at a place where, you know, there's no one around me that I know. It's easy when I travel with my wife because if I'm with my wife, I can grab her hand and we can pray together. I got her, she's got me. But when I'm by myself, and I'm just sitting down there and there's all these people around me and I'm getting ready to eat. It's like, okay. Okay, I'm the only one that feels that way. There's a couple of people nodding their heads, but it can be challenging for us because we are insecure and we wonder how people think toward us and we want to be accepted by our peers and by the rest of the world. And we don't want to be hated by anyone. We love Jesus. After all, we want to be considered good people. It's at those times when it's nice to remember that we are selfish to the core and that Jesus alone is good, none other, and that he himself is our righteousness so that we can put our full trust in him and therefore refuse to deny him in any way, shape, or form in any circumstance or situation because he is our everything. To deny him is to deny anything and everything that matters in life. The other verse we want to look at this morning is found in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, one of my favorite chapters, Daniel 11 verse 43. Now, I'm going to read this verse and I'm going to give you a little bit of background to uh, this particular section of scripture, prophetic scripture, because it is challenging and difficult. Daniel 11 43 says, but he, speaking of this king of the north, that's the context, the flow of the prophecy, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his steps or follow after him. Now, if you combine these two sections, these prophetic sections of Scripture together, what you have is this. There is a power in the end of time, and I would say an alliance of powers, that is going to have control of the gold, the silver, and the precious things so that no man can buy or sell. That's the basic message God is giving. That's why I believe these two chapters actually connect together. Now, again, there is a little bit of controversy over this. The second scripture in Daniel can be a little bit more difficult to understand. And partly because Daniel verses 40 through 45 are somewhat controversial. In our history, there have been varying interpretations. We began with uh, a solid understanding with James White and Uriah Smith, and then there was some variation that took place, and Uriah Smith kind of went in a different direction with Turkey, etc. And then um, James White kind of contended against that, and it was kind of laid to rest with the two views. Kind of, We kind of settled in and just got on to other things. Down through time, and even to today, there's been an awakened interest in Daniel 11. I'm hoping to do a whole series on Daniel 11 when I can get everything together, but there are a lot of people who are wondering about this, and I think it's time for us to wonder. I really do. I think it's time for us to understand, because there are some details in Daniel 11 that you won't find anywhere else in the Bible. Nowhere else. Powerful details that I believe will help us to understand where we are in prophetic history. James White argued, and I think very effectively and correctly, that Daniel 11 follows the sequence of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8. Daniel 11 was just following that sequence of what we call repeat and enlarge. It was covering the same history of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Down to the second coming of Jesus. Now, I don't want to argue with anyone who might have a difference of opinion or hold a certain interpretation about this, but I would like to suggest this morning as we study this important theme of coming economic control that we take a look again at the connection between Daniel 13 and Revel Daniel 11 and Revelation 13 just because we need a little bit of insight 
we do to understand how and when this economic control is going to take place. We see some principles. They've been in place for a while. But what's going to actually usher it in? Are there some other aspects that surround this that can help us to be prepared and to be established in this prophetic truth? Well, one of the things I'd like to suggest. Now, what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to suggest that there are two possibilities that would help us correctly interpret Daniel chapter 11, 40 to 45, and, and 12, 1 through 3. The first one is this. If James White was correct, if Daniel chapter 11 follows the same sequence as Daniel 2, 7, and 8, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, second coming, second coming, second coming, second coming, it would be nice, it would be helpful, because this last section is challenging, if we could find another prophetic section of Scripture that followed the same sequence, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, but went a little bit further and gave us more details about what takes place after 1798 and the deadly wound is inflicted and before Jesus comes. So that's one suggestion. I'm suggesting, just think about this, that you think about the possibility of another section of Scripture prophetic scripture that follows the sequence, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, but takes us a little bit further, giving us more detail about the end of time just before Jesus comes. Because if we could find that section of scripture, if there is such, such a one, it would help us to understand these verses in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Because 40 says at the time of the end, that's 1798, and then all the way through down to 45 and 12, 1, that's when Michael stands up and probation closes. So think about that, and then let me give you possibility number two. I believe that we could begin with Daniel 12 and verse 1. Now, we know what Daniel 12 and verse 1 is talking about. Daniel 12 and verse 1, let's just take a look. If we could start with Daniel 12 verse 1 and go backwards. In other words, here's a point in history. We know what's happening here. Now, before that happens, what happens? And before that happens, what happens? Before that happens, what happens? Let's try it. Daniel 12 verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. What is this time talking about? This is indicating the time when probation closes. Michael standing up is the close of probation for the entire world. This is the same time that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 15 and 16. When the smoke fills the temple and no man can go in, mediation has ceased, the seven last plagues are poured out, there's no more mercy. It's the time that is spoken of well, if referred to in Revelation 7 when the four winds are let loose. Now in Revelation 7 they're being held back until something takes place. And we're going to look at that verse in a minute. But they're let loose. This is a time of trouble that never has been or never will be again. Now, God's people and the world have experienced some times of trouble. For example, Noah and his family experienced a pretty intense time of trouble. I mean, the entire population of the earth was wiped out according to the inspired record. And only eight people survived. That was a time of trouble. In the Dark Ages, God's people experienced a time of trouble. R Matthew 24 describes it as a time of tribulation. Not to be confused with this time of trouble, they're different. How so? Well, in the time of tribulation, the Dark Ages, it is estimated that 50 to 100 million Christians, that is, faithful followers of Jesus Christ, lost their lives. But notice what it says in Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time, thy people shall be, what's the word? Delivered. Everyone that's written in the book is going to be delivered. So there's not going to be any 50 to 100 million people following followers of Jesus losing their life in the time of trouble. In fact, I would suggest from this verse and this verse alone, not one true follower of Jesus will lose their life in the time of trouble. After probation closes, when Michael stands up, no one 
that is a true follower of, Christian, of Christ dies. Zero. Praise God. So there is a difference here. In fact, when Jesus talked about the time of tribulation in Matthew 24, he says, this time of tribulation is, is such as never been nor never will be. So it is different from the time of trouble. The time of tribulation, the dark ages, the 50 to 100 million people, those were Christians. In Noah's day, there weren't Christians that died. The antediluvians were those who didn't get in the ark and weren't Christians. So never has been, never will be. Time of trouble, Daniel 12, 1, no Christians lose their lives. So that tribulation is different. Don't get it confused. Sometimes we get a little bit concerned about the time of trouble and we think, oh man, that's going to be hard. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it will not come nigh thee. Only with thy eyes shall I, shall I see and behold the reward of the wicked, Psalm 91 says. He'll give his angels charge over thee. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. We're going to be in earnest prayer. We are going to be, we are going to be shut in with God. We're going to be, as it were, learning what it means to walk by faith and not by sight wrapping our entire beings around that green cord of faith so we can swing over the chasm to the other side. But God will deliver His people. Amen. Now, we are going to know that because we're going to know before that that God has delivered us time and time again. He's delivered us from ourselves and from our selfishness and from our unrighteousness and, and from all the things that we wrestle with and the reality of who we are. He's delivered us over and over again. And that deliverance, that daily, weekly, monthly, yearly deli deliverance is what has strengthened us and, and encouraged us and, and allowed us to take a hold by faith of his continued deliverance. Some years ago, I started working out at the gym. Ty encouraged me. We were both quite underweight for our size. Both of us for years had this problem. I know that a lot of you don't have this problem, but we did. We weighed about 140, 145 at best. I'm 5'11", 140, 145. Sometimes down to 135, I would be taking my shirt off at home and I would tease my wife. I would suck my, my stomach in and show her my ribcage. No, I don't want to, I don't want to see that. Finally, Ty came to me and said, James, I've gained 10 pounds. I was like, 10 pounds? That's unbelievable. How did you do that? He said, well, it took me a year. <laughs> but I did it by lifting weights. I said, oh... Lifting weights. I don't know if I want to get into lifting weights. That's so, you know. But he said, no, it works. You got to do it. You got to do it. If you, want to, if you want to gain weight, you've got to do it. So I said, okay. Went over to his house the next day, started lifting weights. And of course, he had been in it for a year, and I was just starting. It took me three months to gain five pounds, lifting weights every day, every day. And I remember we went to a gym together. We were at Andrews, and it, he went in, knew the guys there. He'd been there for a week before I had, and he was over there with the 45-pound bar, and he had these 45-pound weights on there, you know, so he had about 130 pounds, and he was just... And I snuck over in the corner, and I grabbed that 45-pound bar, and I was like... I mean, I was weak as water. But I continued. I just kept pursuing it. I was pretty soon I put some two and a halfs on there, and then I put some fives on there, and then I put some tens on there, you know. And I just got stronger and stronger. And while it's still difficult for me to push that bar up because there's more weight on it, I am pushing more weight. I could say that it's probably as difficult for me to push the bar up with the 45s as it was for me to push the bar up without anything on it back then. And that's the way our faith works. It starts in little spurts. We just push the bar up as best we can. And we get stronger and stronger and stronger. And we get to the time of trouble. It's not like, oh, man, we're overwhelmed. Man, I got 45 pounds. How am I going to? No, because our strength, our faith has been strengthening, strengthening by exercise, by exercise, by exercise. And the problem is many of us don't want to exercise faith. We just want it all to be set out for us, and we want God to just provide all these things, and we just want to sit back and just say, yep, just take me into the kingdom. <sighs> and little trials come along, and we go, ah, what was that? How could those people be so unchristian as not to recognize me, and not to say hi to me, and not to smile at me, and not to provide for me, and not to take care of me, and not to think well of me, and not to, not to, not to, not to, me, 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 me. And we don't realize that God in his mercy sent Joseph to Egypt. Not just mercy for his brothers, but mercy for him. 
And he has continued to do that with the Nebuchadnezzars and the Daniels and the Moseses and the Peters and James and Johns and the yous and the me's. And we'll continue to do that. But he will deliver us. He promises to deliver us. Now, going backwards from that time, because we know the context of it, verse 2 is the resurrection, second coming of Jesus. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. We understand that to be that special resurrection. So going back from there, we have verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, and he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. I'm not going to elaborate on that verse. It's probably one of the most difficult and, com- and controversial. But I am going to finish with a thought on it before we're done. I hope I can get back to this thought. We don't run out of time. I'm going to go back now to verse 44. Verse 44. Now remember, we've come to the time of the end, the time of trouble, the close of probation, the resurrection, the second coming of Jesus. We're trying to figure out the events that lead up to that and if Daniel 11, 40 to 45 applies to us today. We go back now to verse 44. I've skipped 45. We're at 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he will go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. This verse is talking about us. I don't know if you realize that. This verse is talking about you and me. Tidings. What are tidings in the Bible? The angel in, in Matthew said, I bring you great tidings. Luke, I bring you great tid- uh, good tidings of great joy. What are the tidings? The, the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel, the everlasting gospel. Tidings out of the east and out of the north. I want you to just look at this verse with me. If you're not familiar with it, I, I think you will be, but you for sure will be by the time we get done. It's in Ma- Revelation chapter 7. People will say, well, okay, what, what are the tidings out of the east and out of the north? What does that represent? Well, let's just go and look at the twin prophetic book of Daniel, and that's Revelation. Because Revelation kind of picks up where Daniel leaves off. Gives us more insight, more understanding. Revelation chapter 7. John is talking about the closing up of the seals. He gets to the sixth seal, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he says, now after these things, after, because the question was asked, who's going to be able to stand when Jesus comes? And he said, well, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, and they were holding the four winds of the earth. Seven last plagues, time of trouble, that's all, it's all the same thing. They're holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel, remember the question's being asked, who's going to be able to stand when Jesus comes? I saw another angel ascending from the, where? The east. What is so special about this angel? Well, this angel has the seal of the living God. And he cried with a, what kind of voice? Loud voice. So I want to make sure you're awake this morning. I think you all are. A loud voice. Hal, you awake out there? Yeah, you're awake. Yeah, okay. A loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. This is the sealing angel. I heard tidings, Daniel 11, verse 44, out of the east. And it troubled this power that's going to set up his tabernacle between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. The one that's going to come to his end and none that helps him. The one that's going to have control over the gold and silver and precious things so no man can buy or sell. The one that enters into the countries and overflows and passes over and enters the glorious land. He's going to be troubled by these tidings. He's going to have control of the world. Everyone's going to acquiesce. But then there are these tidings out of the east that trouble him. The east represents the seal of God. The sealing message. And of course we understand what that points to. It points to people who keep a certain day. Not because they believe that keeping that day is saving them. The Jews tried that. It didn't work. (laughs) They kept the day and executed the Savior. But, but, But they keep that day because they believe that Jesus Christ is their Savior, that he has saved them from their sins, that he has saved them from something that they found it impossible to be saved from in and of themselves. They found it impossible to overcome in and of themselves. And then they have the Savior that prevailed in their behalf. And that caused them to fall deeply in love with Him so that they could not be separated from Him 
And in that context, they experience the words of Christ in John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so they do. Just as a matter of fact. Just because that's what love does. <laughs> not to be saved. And not, not to do it because they're not going to be saved. It's simply an act of love. That's what it is. And so they do it. They're sealed. They're settled. They can't be moved from this. Not the whole world. Not e the hatred of the world. The hatred of the nations. Not economic boycott. Not losing everything and anything that they might hold dear on this earth. Nothing can stop them from worshiping their creator because their love motivates. His love for them motivates them. They're in love with Jesus. So these are the tidings. I mean, this really, you think of Nebuchadnezzar. You remember when those three worthies wouldn't bow? Remember how upset he was? Arr! Well, that Babylonian king is being duplicated right here. The principle is the same. He's upset. He goes forth to destroy and utterly make away many. There's a death decree that's going to go forth just like it did with Nebuchadnezzar against those three young men who wouldn't bow. There's going to be fiery fire that we're going to face, that we're going to experience, but Jesus, the Son of Man, is going to be with us in the furnace. Amen. Praise God. And so tidings out of the east. These are the, the seventh-dayers. And out of the north. Now, this is an interesting phrase, out of the north. I want you to look here at another verse. It's a powerful one. It's in Isaiah 41, verse 25. It's speaking about the... I'm going to give it away here, but I'll just tell you right up. It's speaking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 41, verse 25. Second coming of Jesus Christ, when he comes to dash the nations, when he comes to deliver his people, when he comes to destroy those that destroy the earth. Prophetic language here is, I've raised up one from the north. He shall come from the Rising of the sun, which is from what direction is the, right, the sun rise? From the east. He's coming from the north and from the east. He shall call upon my name. He shall come upon the princes as upon mortar and as the potter treads the clay. This is a prophetic description of Jesus. He comes from the north because Jesus is the true king of the north where Satan wanted to sit on the sides of the north and receive the worship. Of, and he comes from the east. That little cloud about the size of a man's hand grows and grows and grows. So tidings out of the east and out of the north. The good news is a proclamation that's being made in the context of this economic boycott and control. A, a proclamation that's being made of the second coming of Jesus and the Sabbath as the seal of God. And the people that make this proclamation happen to have a name that is God-given. And the name that they have, that God gave them, is... Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventists. Can you imagine that? I mean, look at the verse in Daniel 11, and it, just com it would just completely amaze your brain. But the tidings from the Seventh-day Adventists, the tidings out of the East, Sabbath, and the North, Second Coming, trouble him. You're going to be a troubler of the people, just like Elijah was a troubler of the people. Are you ready for that? Elijah was and wasn't. He stood firmly for God in a time of national apostasy. He called on God. He prayed to God even seven times. And he ran before Ahab's chariot. He got to Jezreel, and he was frightened by a woman. And he ran and ran and ran and ran. And finally he got to a place, and God said in that little cave, Elijah, what are you doing here? I sent you X, Y, and Z, but I didn't send you here. <laughs> not to see, not to cave. I didn't send you here. And you know what Elijah said? Not once, but twice. He said, like Adam said about Eve, and Eve said about the... So he said, well, it was their fault. <laughs> they're in apostasy, and they're, you know, worshiping Baal, and there, and there, and there. It was their fault. Paul says he was interceding against Israel. He was excusing himself. And so God replaced him. God replaced Elijah. He did. When we point the finger at others, when we blame others who are not what they should be or ought to be, when we blame them for our lack of duty, for our lack of commitment, when we blame others around us for vacating the position God has called us to, God's going to replace us, just like he did with Elijah. But you know what? God wasn't through with Elijah, and Elijah humbled himself 
unlike Saul, unlike others, Judas, he humbled himself, and he did what God called him to do, and God took him to heaven. There's always hope for the worst of us. I'm thankful for that, because I know I haven't always done what God wanted me to do. I haven't always stood where God wanted me to stand. I always, haven't always been faithful like God wanted me to be faithful. I know that I need to redeem the time. What about you? And I know that God is gracious, God is merciful, and God will use us still. But be careful. Be faithful with God. So, here it is. We know that the context, context of Daniel 11, leading up to the close of probation, is going to be the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. Revelation 14, Revelation 18, Matthew 24, 15. We know that these verses at least have application to Revelation 13, that there's a connection that's taking place here. Because, of course, Revelation 13 is followed by Revelation 14 and the proclamation of the three angels' messages. And that's exactly what we see here in Daniel eleven forty four. 44. What about Daniel eleven forty three? 43? We looked at that. He was, he's going to have power, control over the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt so that no man's going to be able to buy or sell. What about verse 42? He will stretch forth his hand upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Now, you can take these verses literally, many have, but I think that they're speaking spiritually. I think that these, these verses are speaking of entities and powers in the world in the time in which we live, just before probation closes. Egypt, I think, is identified in Revelation chapter 11. Look there with me in Revelation chapter 11. It talks here about God's servants, God's witnesses being persecuted, being killed. And it says here in Revelation chapter 11, and I'm just looking here at verses 7 and 8, that when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. That is God's witnesses, His Word, the Old and New Testament. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and what? Egypt. This chapter is speaking of the rise of atheism, which took place in France during the French Revolution, 1798 and onward, and the war that was made upon the Word of God, Old and New Testament, and how the Word of God was slain. It lay dead in the streets for those three and a half years, three and a half days, prophetic days, and then again it was resurrected. And in the context of this prophecy, this power of atheism is described as Egypt. Spiritual Egypt. Why? Well, because Exodus 5.2, Pharaoh, responding to God's call to let his people go, says, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let his people go? I don't know the Lord. Neither will I let his people go. So this, I believe, is the power that is spoken about in Daniel 11. He is going to have control. He's going to stretch forth his hand upon the countries. Egypt will not escape. Communism will not escape. <laughs> it will not escape. Basically, it's in line with what Revelation 13 is telling us. There's going to be a one-world unity, a one-world order. There's going to be enforcement of worship. It's going to be religious worship, and communism will not escape that. And today, of course, we, we see that already. The USSR has fallen, basically, already, right? 1989 and onward. Amazing. I mean, it happened just overnight. It was like a whirlwind. It's gone. But we also have another communist power in the world today, and that is China. It's not going to escape. That's what the prophecy says. It's not going to escape. It's, it's a little more detailed than Revelation 13. Revelation 13 says everyone. But Daniel 11 says Egypt. Daniel 11 says Ethiopia. Daniel 11 says, which to me is like, you know, a representation of the Acre nations. Daniel 11 says Libya, Middle East. Daniel 11 talks about the glorious land. We can get into that. I don't have time to cover it all in detail, so I won't tell you what I think about that. But the idea is this. Daniel 11 is telling us every single continent and nation in the world is going to follow along. He's going to establish his tabernacle, his royalty, his kingdom, his power, his authority between the seas, peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues, Revelation 17, 15, and the glorious holy mountain. The glorious holy mountain, Mount Zion. That's where the 144,000 stand with the Lamb in Revelation 14. They stand on Mount Zion. According to Hebrews chapter 12, that's where our names are written. That's the church of the firstborn, Hebrews chapter 11. 
No, it's 12. Hebrews 12, that's the church of the firstborn. And there's only one power that wants to accomplish this, and that is the power of the dragon. He wants to plant himself between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. He wants the worship that belongs to God. He wants all the nations to worship him. He wants to put himself between God and man, between the nations of this earth and the king of the universe. And he's going to do this through a false system of worship because he's going to deceive the people. He's not going to do it outright. He's going to come as an angel of light, an angel of righteousness. So here, I think, in the context, without going into a lot of detail, we have this beautiful, powerful truth. Now, there's one thing I want to focus on before we close, and that is verse 41. I'm not going to spend a lot of time detailing this, but I want us to look at one thing in particular that I think is very powerful. In verse 41, it says, He will enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall, what's the next word? Escape. Now, do you know that word escape? That's a very interesting word. That is the same word that is used in Daniel 12, verse 1, when it says they shall be delivered. Same word. Escape, delivered. Same word. In other words, there are going to be people in Daniel 12, 1 who are delivered, God's people. There are going to be people in Daniel 11, verse 41, who escape. Now, these people are identified as Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. I'd like to suggest, again, that these are spiritual representations of people. And the implication here is, if you look at the history of the Old Testament, is that these people, signified by Edom, Moab, and Ammon, are people who are presently, or at least in the Old Testament times, were enemies of God's people. They were opposed to God's people. They were enemies. They weren't with God's people. They were part of God's people. In other words, what God is saying here is the same thing he's saying in Revelation 14, come out of her, my people. Same thing he's saying in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. I have people out there that aren't in here. They're not part of this. That's why we're here. That's why 3ABN exists. It's really quiet out there. I heard one amen. That's why 3ABN exists. We exist to reach the world with the undiluted message of the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages, to reach God's people that are out there everywhere, the Bills and Toms and Janes, that are to hear his voice. Now, I just want to direct you to a prophecy, excuse me, an explanation of this prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. It's a beautiful chapter. We're going to almost close with this. Daniel... Or, Isaiah chapter 11, the first half of Isaiah 11 is talking about Jesus. The sevenfold spirit is upon him. He's coming. It's his first advent, his first uh, uh, incarnation to this earth. First, first half of the chapter. Uh, Isaiah 11, cha verses 1, all the way through verse 10. Verse 10 is a transition. Verse 10 transitions us. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall be a, stand for an ensign of the people, uh, 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 if you will. Uh, a flag, a, a, what is that? Banner. Banner, standard, right? Okay, and going on. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. That's what 3 ABN is supposed to, an ensign, a banner, a standard. Lift up the standard so the people can see it. And then it goes on, and here it is. Here's what I believe is end time prophetic declaration. Isaiah 11, beginning with verse 11 that will help us to understand what God is going to do in the context of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, Revelation 14, Revelation 18. And it shall come to pass in that day, this day, the Lord shall set his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people. So it's talking about remnant. It's talking about God's remnant people, God's remnant church. Where is he going to recover them from? Which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he will shed up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, the backsliders, the ones who have left the church. He's going to assemble them, the outcasts of Israel. And, of course, others who have been cast out for various reasons. And gather together this first of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Remember the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the winds till the servants of God are sealed. And the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. I love this. Ephraim shall, know, shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. I could talk a little bit here about Hope Channel on 3ABM, but I won't. 
the, the principles are clear. I believe we can see them. But it applies to us on every level of ministry. No more envy, no more contention. No more, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines. The Philistines, those are the people that are out, you know, the, that's CNN, that's Fox News. These are the guys, because we're going to lose money, we're going to lose economic, but these guys are going to broadcast us back then in those days. We're going to be the center of focus of the world. We're going to fly on the shoulders of the Philistines toward the, we, the west. So where are we coming from? The east. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab. And the chief of the children of Ammon shall obey them. These are going to escape out of his hands. Why? Because we're going to be preaching this message, these, these glad tidings that trouble him. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind he shall shake his hand over the river and smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shot. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. Praise God for what he's going to do. In closing, James White, in his little book, A Word to the Little Flock, going back to 1847, Michael, he said, is to stand up at that time when the last power in chapter 11 comes to his end and none shall help him. This power is the last that treads down the true church of God. And as the true church is still trodden down and cast out by all Christendom, it follows that the last oppressive power has not come to his end and Michael has not stood up. This last power that treads down the saints is brought to view in Revelation 13, 11 through 18. And his number is 666. Our pioneers were led by God. God filled them with, filled them with his spirit and gave them truth. And we need to recover that truth, set it in its present day setting, and proclaim it to the world Amen. through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, thank you this morning for your word, for the prophetic declaration of your word, of Daniel and Revelation, and for helping us to recognize the message of the everlasting gospel in all that is taking place. Father, that is where we want our focus to be. Allow us to stay focused on